Hello, thank you all for joining. My name is Michael Igo. I'm a senior reporter with DevX, and I'm honored to moderate this, this discussion on turning the tide, building community resilience through climate justice. We have a fantastic group of participants and speakers here today who are all actively grappling with the question of how to ensure climate action leads to climate justice. It's a question that has never been more important at a time when the entire world has been brought to a standstill by a microscopic virus. It's clear that the systems undergirding our society and economies are fragile. For those on the front lines of climate change, that was already abundantly clear. Uh, climate change too unearths the deep inequities and disparities that see dispro disproportionate impacts fall to those who have contributed least to the problem. And as the world builds back from COVID-19, we face both risk and opportunity. Risk that with unprecedented resources flowing to help countries recover, um, we will lock in those injustices and push climate action further out of reach, but also an opportunity to harness this moment of immense disruption and put climate justice at the forefront of our recovery. So thank you all again for joining. And um, I'll just share a couple of housekeeping notes at the outset here. Um, first to say that uh, DevX has a robust presence during the United Nations General Assembly this week, the 75th General Assembly. Um, and you can take a look at everything that we're up to, all of the events, um, news items, um, and special sections that we're producing at unga75.devx.com. Also, please follow us on social media, at DevX on Twitter, uh, and you can share the hashtag UNGA75, and for this event, hashtag Turning the Tide. Um, also, today we'll be joined by a live illustrator. Pete Mori is here with us today. Uh, he's going to be putting our conversation today into, into visual form, which is, I think, just a really cool element to all of this, um, and that's something that we'll be sharing uh, along with a recording of the event with you all at the conclusion. This event is a live extension of our content series, Turning the Tide, which looks at how innovation and satellite technology can improve climate change resilience in small island developing states. Please make sure to check that out as well on DevX. I also want to do a quick plug for a report that DevX is releasing at the end of this month for our DevX Pro members. It's called the Climate Finance Challenge. It looks at what kind of financing is needed to achieve the global climate goals, provides insights into the data and key players on, on climate finance. It's available for DevX Pro subscribers on September 30th. Um, and it digs into a range of different questions like, should oil companies receive climate finance? Can the world mobilize 1% of GDP for nature? How can we reach smallholder farmers? Um, and a range of other topics. You can subscribe or access a free trial for DevX Pro at devx.com slash pro. With all of that said, um, I would like to welcome our first speaker who will be making some opening remarks. We're extremely honored and extremely grateful to be joined today by Her Excellency Ambassador Nazat Shamin Khan, who's the permanent representative of the Republic of Fiji to the United Nations in Geneva, Thank you so much for being here, Your, Your Excellency, and I will turn the floor over to you. Thank you very much indeed. Bula Vinaka to everyone, and it is a great pleasure uh, to be speaking um, at this very important event uh, and with its particular focus on the Pacific. We know that climate change has the capacity to affect people differently. It was a former US Supreme Court judge who said, there is no greater inequality than the equal treatment of unequals. So effective climate policy will take into account the fact that climate change has the ability to affect people disproportionately and differently. And so a successful climate policy will take all of that into account and integrate into its national framework, the lived experiences of people. We say that the key to the future of responding to climate change is building resilience. 
whether it's climate change resilience, which is the improved ability to anticipate and to prepare for disasters and disturbances, or community resilience, which is the ability of communities to use available resources to respond and to withstand and to recover from adverse situations. But very importantly, resilience is also the language of empowerment. We must never put people into a framework of being perpetual victims. Building resilience is about involving communities and ensuring that it is communities which will lead the response uh, to, to climate change and to disasters. I believe that if we are to effectively deal with the climate crisis, if we are to reduce emissions, to save our marine life, our oceans, if we are to protect our endangered species and to grow more food and trees, then communities are absolutely central to this charge. Of course, political will is important. Political will eventually is a change maker, but political will is of no consequence unless it is backed by the imperatives of the needs of people and communities. And in particular, those who work on the land, who work with the land, and who understand the resources that, that, that surround them. And I speak specifically of indigenous people and local communities. It is their knowledge, ultimately, that must help to build national climate policy. So the translation of community resilience into the fabric of climate policy and climate change work is important. And this is where I think it's important also that we remember how important it is, I'm sorry, I've used the word important many times, how important it is that decisions made by communities should be informed by science. In Fiji, we've had a very successful experience with a common sensing project because the common sensing project has the ability to bring together climate resilience and community resilience in a single system. It ensures that data systems and knowledge and community decision-making are embedded as part of uh, the national system. So as an example, for disaster displacement, when we speak with a community about whether they need to move, what are the, the consequences of moving, where they should move, and how they are to cope when they have moved, it's very important that those decisions are not only community-led, but that communities understand that this is what the science is telling our people. And for Fiji, therefore, the Common Sensing Project has been absolutely essential and integral to this fusion, to this partnership between political will, commun building community resilience, and building a national framework for climate policy. So the Common Sensing Project supports decision making, makers in answering the critical question relating to climate change resilience by having information readily available on exposure to hazard, on vulnerability, and on coping mechanisms. Thank you very much for this important discussion. I look forward to the input of all the uh, speakers today and the best of luck in your deliberations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. That, that was a perfect overview and you've given us uh, some great material to dig into with our panel and then also in our discussion of the Common Sensing Project when we went to a more detail on that later on. Thank you so much for those remarks. A great scene setter, I think. So let me very quickly introduce our panelists. We have Kamal Narayan, who's a climate activist and volunteer with the Fiji-based Alliance for Future Generations. Simon Lambert is with the University of Saskatchewan. He's an associate professor who studies how indigenous communities cover their disasters. Paul Pasisi is the senior advisor, the director general of the Pacific Community. And Jackie Patterson is senior director of the Environmental and Climate Justice Program at the NAACP. Also, for joining. I think at this point, we're going to dive right into our conversation. We have about a minute or five of us, uh, and we'll have some short Q&A after that. If you do have a question, you can submit it in the queue box um, here on Zoom, and 
uh, we'll dive into those as soon as we've had our, our panel discussion. Um, Coral, let me start with you if I could. I wonder if you could sort of take up the editor's remarks there, uh, planning, include challenge of incorporating climate into climate, you've experienced it. How can we ensure that climate change plans and projects build upon the priorities and experiences of indigenous and other affected communities? Hi, well, thank, thank you so much for the opportunity um, and to Ambassador Khan for, for such a great opening and providing uh, that really important context uh, from the Pacific. Um, I, I'll just give you a little bit of context, I think, around uh, the indigenous communities and traditional knowledge uh, on, in the Pacific landscape and then um, sort of address uh, the, your, your question more directly. Uh, I think it's important to note um, that indigenous people constitute the vast majority of, of populations in, in, the, in most, if, if not all, the Pacific Island countries. Um, and the same can be found in the decision-making systems at in top levels of government, at the sub-regional level, and certainly uh, at the community level. So our cultural identity and traditions are very important as benchmarks already in uh, our development um, and certainly uh, in, in resilience uh, resilience building. And this is quite an organic process because we still practice and depend on that traditional knowledge um, for our everyday lives, to be quite honest. Um, <clears throat> so, and it's also um, what we often revert to in times of disaster to build our resilience. And whether that's um, natural disasters, climate induced disasters, um, and even COVID-19. So we still very much depend on the knowledge of uh, weather, climate cycles uh, to inform our fishing practices, our harvest uh, practices and our conservation practices. So this is really part of our ordinary life to be quite, to be quite honest, <clears throat> particularly in smaller countries and certainly in the vast majority of rural areas. And if you consider that for most countries in the Pacific, I think around uh, 70 to 90% of our populations live within one kilometer of the coastal areas. So I think that's, that's an important backdrop because it's a part of our natural decision-making processes already. Um, having said that, and, and it's also important to note, I think that in the consultation processes around climate change, whether it's developing national communications, adaptation planning, et cetera, the communities are integrally involved in those consultations, uh, youth groups, um, indigenous people, uh, uh, and generally um, a number of other groups uh, and civil society groups are part of those discussions. And so we naturally have that traditional knowledge coming into those discussions and then reflected in adaptation plans, et cetera. I think what is a challenge though, um, is that when we try to balance the science and traditional knowledge and bring those two together, we don't do that quite um, as well as we should. I don't think we give the same level of importance uh, and formality to traditional knowledge and cultural practice and that information as we do to science. And in reality, the two complement each other very well. We don't have anywhere near the science or the history of science uh, and data, scientific data upon which to make informed decisions in the Pacific. And so we absolutely have to um, supplement that with traditional knowledge and historical knowledge. I think a good example <clears throat> uh, for me is when you're developing hazard maps. Um, we don't have the historical knowledge of wave inundation from the different sizes of cyclones over the history of the Pacific. But when you sit down with elders in a the community, they know uh, they have a 60 to 70 year view and knowledge of where waves came to in different areas um, through, through the last 70 years. So if we digitize that into a GIS, GIS system that underpins decision-making, we have a much better idea of historical hazard zones um, than we would from any modern modeling approach um, to date. So I think um, we are certainly trying to bring the two together, but we haven't established a formal system of verifying traditional knowledge um, to give it the importance that it should have um, both in informing uh, planning, but also in informing investment 
So it's very hard to get climate finance without showing um, scientific data to underpin your projects. And when we try to insert traditional knowledge and experience in that, um, it's not really taken as seriously. So I think we have a long way to go in um, ensuring that that science and traditional knowledge infusion, as Ambassador Khan had put it, is strengthened uh, across our communities. Um, <clears throat> so I, I think I'll stop there and, and make a few points uh, a little bit later on. But um, this, this key issue of science uh, and traditional knowledge is, um, it is applied for sure, but it is not uh, as well formalized uh, in our decision-making processes as it should be. But it's certainly stronger in the Pacific than I've seen in other um, countries. And it's, and it's also not as formally acknowledged in the financing institutions uh, as it should be. And it makes it very difficult for us to get the resources to implement on the basis of what tradition and culture um, is informing us about. So thank you. Great, thank you very much, Coral. Uh, that was fantastic. And I think I might ask Simon to sort of respond, not to put you on the spot as the, the scientist necessarily, but I wonder in your own work, have you found that disaster risk reduction efforts are adequately informed by traditional knowledge? Um, and have you seen innovative or particularly effective uh, efforts to integrate traditional and more sort of traditionally scientific knowledge in disaster risk reduction? Well, kia ora, Michael. Uh, short answer to the first part of your question, no. Uh, and often for reasons that Coral has outlined, that quite simply, um, there's always an assumption that uh, indigenous knowledge and local knowledge, uh, indigenous communities, knowledge keepers, knowledge holders, elders, will work for free. They will work for love, that they will turn up time and time again, 7.30 to a church hall meeting uh, at night in the middle of winter, or just do stuff for free. And they have in the past, and many still do. But uh, people are busy. People now have an awareness of what their knowledge is worth, and they're starting to ask uh, to be compensated, to be recognized, to be respected. Right, just simply to be for that knowledge to be respected. And there's a cost to that. And it's not just going to be a $20 petrol voucher moving forward. First thing. Uh, and second thing, have I seen examples of that? I have, and I have seen uh, a lot of very strong attempts in New Zealand. Uh, and that has come about primarily through treaty settlements as the government has settled treaty claims with individual tribes those tribes have received legislated roles in regional and local governance. Uh, through various pieces of legislation, they are formal stakeholders. That term is a little controversial. I mean, the argument is that tribes are treaty partners, but you'll often see the word stakeholders used. So they become involved uh, in very key ways in discussions on, on planning, on spatial planning, on um, resource consents and so on. So hazard management, disaster risk reduction has been a part of a lot of conversations over the last 10, 15 years. Climate change particularly, um, much of New Zealand uh, urban settlements are coastal. And as Coral was pointing out, I mean, in the Pacific, they're within a kilometer or so generally of the coastline. Uh, in New Zealand, Last stats I can remember, I think maybe 70% of New Zealand's population is within maybe 40 kilometers of the ocean, but just the lifelines vulnerability to inundation from sea surge, sea level rise, tsunami and so on is significant. So tribes recognize that. They've seen that over the long periods of time that they've occupied these, these territories and they are starting to demand action. So what that's starting to look like in New Zealand and, and also in Canada, where I, I now am, is relocation of communities uh, to the north of Canada with the loss of uh, the ice roads, with the change of migration routes for many key species. It is becoming increasingly difficult for communities to survive. Uh, so that talking about moving. So the adaptation 
it amounts to forced migration. And I see that too in the in the Pacific. And this is this is frightening for people. Uh, and I mean, indigenous knowledge provides all sorts of insights. And at the moment, the the lack of key messages getting through to key decision makers at the highest levels of, of the state and corporate world, I think is a significant hindrance to indigenous community and other community resilience. Great, thank you for that, Simon. Um, so we've been speaking about communities um, and you know, incorporating communities into climate planning, climate action based on their sort of community identity. But of course we know that individuals within a community um, bring their own concerns, considerations, identities to bear on these challenges. Um, Kamal, I wonder, could you talk about what intersectional climate action looks like in practice and sort of break down that term that we might be more familiar with in other contexts um, in the ways that it relates to the climate change conversation as you see it. Uh, thank you, Michael, for that. And thank you, Ambassador Khan, for sort of bringing a Pacific perspective to this whole conversation. And I think when we talk about uh, climate intersectionality from the perspective of the Pacific people, uh, it's something that we um, it's something that comes up in the conversation every now and then. So uh, we all know that <clears throat> climate change impacts marginalized people and communities, you know, more significantly than others. And these include uh, people with disabilities, the LGBTQI communities. So um, it's impacted both at the international and local level. So, and also globally, the country is least responsible for emissions and most impacted by you know systemic, uh, systematic oppression such as colonialism, are those who are now being affected the hardest by climate change. So locally, climate change and extreme weather often impact people and communities who are marginalized in society more severely and for a longer period of time. So this could be small scale farmers who are already being pushed out by industrial agriculture and are then hit by flooding or unpredictable weather. Or people in communities with less access and support to resources, such as communities of color, working class, or people with disabilities and the LGBTQI communities. And Often these are the ones who are most affected during you know, times of disasters when we talk about high intensity cyclones or being, uh, you know, you're having to relocate your homes. So groups in the margins are prevented from finding resources to build resilience and efficient solutions. And beyond giving charity to affected communities, we need to show solidarity, challenge the power relationship and walk together without the group dominating another based on class, race, gender, etc. And I guess just to add on a bit more to it, uh, you know, we often talk about climate justice and how the lives of people should be at the center of such discussions. But in practice, you know, when we actually really sit down and talk about policies and commitments, we hardly see this happening. So I feel that the level of community engagement we see are far much less than the level of engagement that we expect to be seeing because, you know, you cannot have a room full of scientists and policy makers and say that the vulnerable and the marginalized are you know, well represented and we are giving them a voice. Uh, more should be done in this area. I mean, you know, especially when you're going out into the communities or having to deal with um, individuals from rural, rural communities. And I think this is where youth led organizations and religious organizations also play a, a bigger role in that because of the influence they have over rural communities. So if the science, uh, if the scientists, the policymakers, the governments are able to work together, you know, hand in hand with uh, youth groups and religious organizations, I think more work can be done in this area and we'll be able to have uh, more involvement from these rural communities in, uh, and for them being able to actively engage in, you know, such decision-making processes. So, yeah. Great, Kamal, thank you so much for that. Um, and I, you know, I, I do want to sort of pull out of this that we're we're speaking at um, a pretty dramatic moment here, where there's been significant, highly visible conversation about you know COVID recovery and ensuring that the COVID recovery is a green recovery. Um, but I wonder if we're hearing the the same amount of energy um, around making sure that that green recovery is also a just one. 
And Jackie, I'd, I'd love to get your input here. You know, at a time when there seems to be a willingness to really um, dive into pretty fundamental questions about the structure of the economy and, and social fairness, um, what needs to happen to, to make sure that this, this conversation about building back better, you know, a green recovery, that that's truly endowed with these elements of, of justice? Yes, thank you so much. Yeah, that's the that's the thing. Um, the most important um, the most important um, measure that we can put in place to ensure that happens is to make sure that communities, frontline communities, are at the front lines of making decisions and planning what happens next. We've seen so often what happens when frontline communities aren't, you know, when, when false solutions end up being advanced, whether it's even as we recognize we need to shift away from coal, then we saw a push towards natural gas and the solution of natural gas being the new solution. And again, if it were frontline communities and decision-making power, then we wouldn't be moving to false solutions like natural gas, even um, moving, there's conversations around moving towards more nuclear and if the communities who, like the communities in Cayenta, Arizona, for example, who are who are on the front lines of having um, uranium mining clinics, you know, cl clinics for uranium miners. So it's actually institutionalized the health, the harms of the of the nuclear um, industry in the, in those communities, largely indigenous communities and so forth. Then we know that they would not be certainly pushing for that type of solution. So really making sure the communities who will be bearing the, the brunt of the externalities from false solutions are actually there to say, no, we actually have alternatives that are truly green, that are truly um, causing the least harm, and that, I can, and that can actually have a, an economy that's inclusive where communities are owning their energy infrastructure through, for example, solar microgrids, where where we're really gaining energy from, from natural sources like, like large scale wind. And where we're making sure that as we're making this shift, it's not just another investor owned um, uh, industry, even in, in, in the new energy economy, but we make sure that it is distributed generation so that the, the, the primary goal of the energy sector is to create energy, not to create profits for a wealthy few. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's wonderful. And I, I think it, your comments there sort of connect back to something that, that Coral, said, Coral pointed out from her experience at the outset, which was that, you know, the institutions, the sort of channels that we have for supporting ideas, um, supporting plans and supporting action need to pivot in a way that makes them more receptive to the ideas that are coming from the grassroots, from the communities themselves. And I would love to hear from any of you who wants to jump in on this. You know, at DevX, we're very practical in our orientation. We try to, um, to cover the news in a way that's going to, to help people who are out there working on these challenges work more effectively and efficiently. Um, and so when you think about sort of the, the world of climate finance institutions or, um, you know, any of the other major uh, actors that are presumably ostensibly tasked with, with you know, ensuring that we do have this uh, this just uh, version of climate action. How do they need to pivot to be um, more aware and more aligned with the kinds of solutions that you all are describing, which tend to emerge from communities themselves, and you know, not um, not to be uh, laid on top of the communities? What, what needs to happen sort of institutionally to make all of this real? I might um, take a stab at that, Michael, if that's okay. Um, I think it's really, you know, just important to just check in that ultimately um, mitigation is what we need. There are, we, we can, develop the best resilience, uh, we can get the finances to roll, roll those initiatives out. But the truth is uh, we are gonna suffer a lot of loss and, and damage, um, regardless of how quickly um, the world acts now in mitigation. So they have to act quickly to reduce that level of, uh, of necessary res uh, resilience and loss um, that we're gonna suffer. 
Um, but traditionally, climate finance has focused on the biggest polluters. They think that we, because we produce so little in the Pacific, investing in renewables and that kind of technology isn't going to make a big difference uh, to the global footprint of climate change. And that's probably true to some extent. However, um, the Pacific uh, and probably other developing countries as well have long been the dumping grounds of obsolete technology. Um, we've had that as vehicle emission um, standards in our importing countries have gone up, all the cheap rubbish cars come to the Pacific. We've had that when the world went digital, we bought all the analog phones for a dollar. Um, and so, you know, as countries like Europe are progressing towards uh, electric vehicles, for example, we have to make sure that the mitigation investments in the Pacific, both in policy and um, technology transfer and the finance to purchase, uh, ensures that we don't become a, another dumping ground for all of this type of cheaper technology that then locks us into a dependency on imported fossil fuels, which we already are in. Um, so I think from that perspective, we've got to look at resilience building in the mitigation sector as a real issue to underpin our security and sustainable development going forward. I think in relation to the COVID uh, reset that we have upon us, um, it really is an opportunity for the world to reset. And it's really important, right? We've, re we've already reached the peak of fossil fuel development uh, globally. We're not gonna get too much more efficient on combustion engines, but we have a huge potential growth that the world does need uh, in renewable energy technologies. And we just have to make sure that developing uh, communities uh, and indigenous people are not left out of that investment opportunity and don't end up with all the junk that comes in that they then have to deal with. So I think that's really critical. On the, on the adaptation side and the resilience building uh, side of things, I think a key issue which someone also raised uh, from the audience is, um, you know, how do you deal with short-term investments in small communities and small countries? And this is a real killer for us because it it starts and stops and starts and stops and nothing is really sustainable. We really need long-term sustainable financing arrangements that are commensurate with the absorptive capacity of communities and countries. I would rather have $100,000 that I can spend over a period of time uh, and that it's um, flexible in use uh, for community needs than a million dollars that's locked into a three-year time period with deliverables and KRAs that are just impossible to keep up with because we have such changing capacities uh, in communities and small countries. So I think, um, you know, it, it, that's really, it's really important to look at those modalities of investment um, to support communities. And because we're so small, you know, the big banks and the big donors who want to be able to tick off millions of dollars of investment to say that they've invested this in resilience of, and you know, com communities that are at risk, you know, it doesn't fit their, their profile, doesn't fit their interests. Um, and that's really got to change. We've got to set benchmarks that communities and um, indigenous people uh, and developing countries set for themselves. What is it, what, what is uh, the resilience that we need to build by 2030 when, when uh, potentially 90% of our coral reef systems have gone, when um, you know, such a huge part of the populations depend on that for free food. So um, yeah, I think empowering communities and small countries to put on the table the uniqueness of their challenge uh, and then getting um, donors and investors that are forward looking and actually wanting to address that rather than, you know, uh, answering to the global pressure of having to produce more and more billions of dollars, but not actually looking at how that's invested uh, with the most uh, impact. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's a, a profound <laughs> challenge that you've laid out there and one that I'm sure um, a lot of people in our, our audience today are familiar with. Um, and really a challenge I think that speaks uh, not just to climate justice, but also to the ways that um, the entire sort of field and sector of global development operates. Um, so yes, I mean, can communities be put at the center of development planning, of climate planning, and determine not just the priorities, but the ways that um, accountability works and, and success is determined? Um, yeah, those are huge questions and a, a great challenge that you've laid out. 
does anyone else want to weigh in on this this issue of you know the the institutions that are out there working on these issues how can they change uh, to better support sort of the vision that you've all outlined here see michael there's one thing i'll jump in and say uh following on from uh carl's comments that i think the unsustainable model of development is laid bare like there are very few people now arguing uh, as they were say five years ago that that we can simply engineer our way out of of this and so there's uh there are practical fears uh and hazards right in front of us there's an existential angst and and fear as well uh and what i've seen uh is increasingly people looking to indigenous philosophies for the answer uh now that's a double edged sword um because we don't have all the answers uh and in fact we don't argue we have all the answers we're looking to collaborate and work in with whoever has the knowledge but certainly i think a lot of young and not so young non-indigenous people are starting to open up that space where our leaders and our voices are being heard as offering uh you know some very obvious um positions so a holistic interpretation of life on the planet I mean a lot of the stuff is not rocket science but now to say that in a meeting around uh you know 12 suits talking oil is no longer quite so so radical as it was just a few years ago so I think there has been an important shift as people see the failure of current models now starting to entertain thought of alternatives and indigenous philosophies and approaches are a part of that mix like i say it's a double edged sword because um you know we are we're being drawn in 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 ways that we do not necessarily uh control thank you simon yeah yeah um i want to i want to return to something that i think relates to both of your your comments um which gets to sort of the the existential aspect of what you just described simon um but also the the sort of nuts and bolts issues that we've been talking about as well um and coral alluded to this in her remarks as well this sort of the timeline of planning um you know this the sort of search for um short and measurable solutions to an urgent crisis versus viewing things on a longer time scale and giving communities the flexibility to implement projects in the way that they best see fit you know if we're talking about this is a a question that came in from the audience and i think it's a great one if we're talking about integrating traditional knowledge and science um into planning i mean that's that sounds like something that requires time to process and contextualize and as we've pointed out a couple of times now you know donor funded projects typically have tight pretty tight schedules um so you know where is the possibility to sort of bring these two different um sort of modes of functioning to some sort of meeting point where you know donors can uh can achieve greater success because they're leveraging the knowledge that's coming from the places where they're working um but that knowledge is able to fit into some sort of you know project planning um structure which i maybe someday that will be you know completely overcome and and we'll all have total flexibility but you know where's the meeting point for these two things um in the the short to medium term as well i'm happy to take a stab at that um and i'm conscious i don't want to keep jumping in uh, and my colleagues please um don't be shy um so i think the understanding the incremental cost of climate change is difficult uh, and that's normally where the invest that's normally what um guides the investment whether it's public money or it's international finance etc and so we do need to make a judgment call when we don't have the science so i think at the country level um in the pacific uh, traditional knowledge is used ad hoc in that manner um i want to reflect on a project that i was working on when i first got out of university so this would be over 20 years ago without giving away too much information about my age um we developed a gis system to underpin a land and marine resource use plan 
uh, but we, we couldn't afford the satellite imagery at the time. It was about $7,000 for a Landsat image of 100 square, kilometer, 100 square miles to cover our island. So we had one Landsat image and we had aerial photography from the 60s, which we digitized into a GIS system. That wasn't sufficient by way of information or Western systems of information underpinning uh, you know, development agenda. So we went out to all the villages and got uh, communities to draw in uh, on, their, on the aerial photography where they had areas of traditional uh, uh, food security, of um, traditional medicine gathering, where they had drought, droughts would affect different areas, etc. And that was simply digitized into the GIS system as an additional layer of information. That was an absolutely phenomenal uh, integrated decision-making arrangement that brought together you know, the science that we had, remote sensing technology and traditional uh, knowledge. Um, and then each of the villages was able to have their own plan that they used. And that had some currency with the banks for their development and et cetera. So that was really great. The hard thing is that was a three, three year project, which we had funding for three years and that's it. Building up the knowledge of how to manage a GIS system is not easily in small communities or countries. And so it eventually, um, you know, was difficult to maintain that database. And so the investment in this type of technology and these types of systems needs to be pulled in the region. And that's partly what the SBC, um, a big part of what SBC does. It, it provides a central repository for the information on GIS systems across the region and it provides that backup because it's really impossible to build that capacity in each individual country. But it has to have a system that's easily accessible to communities and governments to be able to draw down on that information information in those systems when they need to make decisions. That is a difficult part that we've struggled with for 20 years because of the intermittent uh, funding arrangements uh, and training. You know, plus for us, our, our GIS system just got washed off, us, off the cliff in a category five cyclone. Um, so it's one thing to have the technology and the information and there's really cool things that you can do with that to integrate um, traditional knowledge, but being able to maintain that kind of um, system is, is very difficult. Uh, you need a lot of capacity, a lot of shared capacity and investment. And on you know, the, the investment in, in the science, in gathering the science to put into that system and the traditional knowledge, we need long-term planning and uh, we need long-term finance not short project-based funding that just doesn't work. Um, and no one wants to fund science uh, really because it's such a long-term commitment. Certainly not the climate financing institutions. They expect us to be able to fund or find the funding for the science ourselves and then put together a proposal that will secure climate finance. But who's gonna fund the science in, in, in these cases or, or gather the, the traditional knowledge? So. Um, it really does require uh, a lot of different stakeholders to understand the situation, our unique uh, circumstances, um, and to be willing to invest in that and not create something new, but build on, on what we've done so far and what we've proven is useful, but needs a few plugs to make it work in, in a sustainable manner. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, we have a question from one of our, our viewers, our participants, who um, I think very interestingly has sort of flipped our conversation around a little bit. So we've been talking a lot about how community participation um, and uh, a sort of justice mindset um, can help you know, achieve um, better climate change outcomes. But we have a, a question from a, a viewer who's wondering if a a stronger focus on environmental democracy, um, such as opening up environmental data um, and then citizen participation in decision making, whether those might also hold the potential to generate more sustained political will for serious climate action. And I really like that because I think it's sort of, um, it's switching the conversation around a little bit and reminding us, I think that, um, you know, as has been pointed out, what's needed is is urgent political will for climate action, um, in addition to some really well implemented programs. But you know, does this does this conversation about openness and inclusion also have the potential 
to bring more people in um, and to build more of a movement around urgent climate action. Jackie or Kamal, I wonder if, if either of you has thoughts on that. Yes, um, definitely. Um, certainly we have found with the, some of the organizing, uh, all of the organizing that the, um, that the more we have approaches that are multi-solving, that really do involve uh, various sectors of, of, of our society to see themselves in the solutions that are being advanced. And that is, and through kind of really grassroots mobilization and grassroots um, articulation and framing and messaging, and as well as the, the substance of the solutions being ones that are not only just addressing environment in its kind of traditional form, but addressing environment through job creation, through, um, through community, community beautification, through cultural preservation, really making sure that as we, as we talk about the solutions that we want, that we're talking about it in a comprehensive, holistic way. So for example, in um, the United States, in, um, in, the, uh, in Portland, Oregon, there was a Portland Clean Energy Fund. And, and it really picked up steam when it was a recogni recognition of the importance of citizen participation and and the and we use citizen use loosely because there's a whole immigration rights issues here that uh, make it a little bit of a sensitive situation but just people participation um, and really bring everyone to the table whether it's disability rights folks labor rights folks and making sure that in that piece of legislation it is it's explicitly names the ways that it advances justice collectively, racial justice, economic justice, gender justice, immigration rights justice, LGBTQ justice, that, that, it, that, we, that we make sure that, that by, by making a big tent and a big table that's inclusive, that we are, as we say, multi-solving for all the ills of society that have kind of similar underpinnings to what is driving climate change. And that's the exploit, exploitive and extractive economies that are that are driving the oppression of people and the commodification of, of natural resources in a way that's that's harming the earth and, and, and harming its inhabitants. So by, by having that kind of comprehensive framing and having solutions that are multi-solving, we've been able to, to have that that level of uh, grassroots mobilization that has been the only way to success in advancing progressive policy making. So thank you. <laughs> Um, if, if I may just also add to what um, Jackie has mentioned, um, you know, um, the level of just creating that whole grassroots movements and being able to engage communities and individuals, um, um, you know, especially when, uh, when we're working on policies and uh, regulations, and then you say that, you know, okay, we're going to have like a um, very thorough consultation with all stakeholders involved, communities, youth groups, CSOs. So, so it's not just a matter of just getting them together in one room and having them sit down and just um, uh, coordinating the whole process, but also ensuring that they actually feel welcome there and they are being able to sort of, you know, um, contribute towards whatever policy is being talked about and talk about their own experiences and getting that assurance that, you know, their experiences will be taken into consideration and um, it will be sort of articulated into that particular um, policy or um, even when you have uh, multilateral funding coming in and um, local organizations like, you know, uh, NGOs or CSOs who are able to uh, tap into these uh, fundings, you know, um, they are the ones who are actually more vocal and more active with the grassroots community. So uh, just being able to go back to the community and just asking them, like, what are your priorities like in this particular area? And how do you see yourself uh, fitting into this project? And if we do have this project and we um, implement it within your community, what all do you require from our end? Uh, what materials, what tools, what resources? Is there sort of any particular training that you need from our end? And um, also after we go back, after we finish this particular project, how, how will you guys be able to sustain it? Do you guys have the necessary tools available to do that? Or do you guys want us to come back, you know, every two or three years just to ensure that you know you guys are on track and if there are any issues that you're encountering um, you know uh, so yeah I guess just being able to think about these little things along the lines because in the end if you have corporate like uh, better cooperation any 
any bottom up approach, it sort of creates more inclusive and more productive decision making. Fantastic. Thank you, Kamal. And thank you, Jackie, as well. Um, I think those are great sort of calls to action. Um, I'm going to ask very quickly uh, if my colleague, we speak in the spirit of, of sort of democratic decision making, we've put out some, some polls ahead of this event. Um, and uh, I think if we could bring up one of those now. Um, so we're asking, how can we best ensure efforts to counter climate change are equitable? and asking for a choice between addressing racial inequality, protecting cultural identity and traditional knowledge, and building community resilience through climate justice. Um, so feel free to weigh in there. Um, and I'm gonna use that as a bit of a segue. I'm sorry to say that our, our sort of first panel discussion here has, uh, has come to an end and we're gonna transition over to a fireside chat with our colleague from the Common Sensing Project, Richard Tu. Um, I would ask if our other panelists are able to stick around, that would be great. Um, and maybe we'll do some closing remarks at the end. Um, but Richard too, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Richard's a professor of geo geoinformatics and disaster risk reduction at the Resilient Futures Lab at the School of the Environment, Geography and Geosciences at the University of Portsmouth. And he's gonna talk to us a bit about <coughs> common sensing um, and also how it fits into this conversation that we've been having about climate justice, inclusion, planning, decision-making, and action. Richard, thanks so much for being here. Thank you very much, Michael. Thanks for the introduction. Just to begin, could you um, get us all sort of up to speed a little bit um, at the, the um, sort of basic level? What is the Common Sensing Project? Um, and can you give us a, a bit of an update on what the project has achieved so far? Yeah, uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, the Common Sensing Project is uh, a consortium uh, of um, organizations uh, led by the United Nations through the Institute of Training and Research, UNITAR, uh, along with the Commonwealth Secretariat, uh, the UK Met Office, um, uh, Sensonomic, which is a um, looks at agricultural metrics, um, ourselves at the University of Portsmouth, uh, and we're working with the governments of Fiji, Vanuatu, and the Solomon Islands uh, to use satellite imagery more effect as effectively as possible towards answering uh, some of the issues that we've got with uh, climate change, climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction. Uh, the project's been running now since 2018. It's a three year project uh, and it's due to finish in 2021. Uh, so we're well into um, collecting the data, processing the data and coming up with um, outputs uh, that we think will assist um, the peoples of uh, small island developing countries focusing initially on Fiji, Vanuatu and the Solomon Islands um, with the problems that we face with climate change. Now, um, why use satellite remote sensing? Well, um, the project's been funded by the UK Space Agency. Um, it's one of the largest projects they've ever funded through their international partnerships program. Uh, and the one thing about satellite imagery is that it gives you very much the big picture. You can see hundreds of thousands of square kilometers um, at any, in any one um, snapshot of the Earth's surface. We call them scenes. Uh, something that Coral mentioned sprang to mind when she was talking about using um, Landsat imagery for um, coastal management uh, work and a coastal management GIS. Um, she was talking about the very high cost of satellite imagery in the order of $7,000 about 20 years ago. Uh, and that was one of the issues that uh, in recent years has got to be less of a problem. Uh, most of that data now is freely available. And there's a lot of data out there that could be readily used by um, countries who've got uh, lots of islands, lots of low lying areas, lots of communities in those settings. Uh, so there's plenty of data out there. And one of the things the Common Sensing Project is doing is collating all of that information into what we call an open data cube. 
So vast amounts of data for each of those countries, for all of the islands of Fiji and Vanuatu and the Solomons, and that's over a thousand islands altogether. Uh, that's all then been um, processed through the data cube uh, and allows us to pick out features such as hazard zones, vulnerable communities, and also look at safer areas. Uh, working with the Met Office, we can also look at trends in climate change and predict what would likely to be uh, more hazardous areas in the future as a result of climate change with more storms, more erosion, uh, and so on. Um, another thing that Cora mentioned was the uh, issues with building up a GIS, and it takes a lot of time to develop that, a lot of expertise to do it. So one thing that we're trying to do through the Common Sensing Project is make the layers inside that data cube as straightforward and easy to follow so that they can be used for planners and decision makers right the way through from government level down right the way through to district level and community, community level. Uh, so that's making use then of what we call analysis ready data. Uh, it requires minimal processing to actually produce the map that shows you the areas that are likely to be flooded and therefore guide you into maybe not building your new community center in that particular location. So uh, we've got vast amounts of data that we're making available. We're processing it to highlight the areas of hazard, vulnerability, and risk. We're also using the data to look at changes over time in terms of uh, coastal erosion, deforestation, uh, features like that. And it's readily understandable. It can be looked at, you can download a map sheet. It's all available for free. It can be downloaded through the internet. And so you can get these different map layers that can help to inform and improve the decision-making process. Excellent. Yes, thank you, Richard. I mean, it's the scope of the project, I think is really incredibly striking. Um, you know, when you're talking about vast expanses of the, the Pacific and, and places that are extreme distances from each other. But I also know that, you know, you, you've got a keen interest in making sure that this is information that's, as you've said, has practical value uh, to people who are making decisions at a, what sounds like a wide variety of scales. So can you talk about sort of, I mean, how is it that, that a project using satellite data is able to bridge the gap between local decision making and national decision making? Is it the same data being used in both contexts or very different? Um, and yeah, and where do you see that, that sort of aspect of, of use across scales going from here? Yeah, the data can be used at many levels and you can carry out different types of analysis with the data. So one part of the common sensing project is looking at food security uh, and working very closely with uh, various ministries in, in Vanuatu, in Fiji, and in the Solomon Islands and uh, other aspects are then working with the uh, National Disaster Management Offices and with other aspects of government as well, looking at communities which are, th are threatened from climate change, living on the coast, maybe from flooding or erosion or from debris flows and coming down in flash floods down uh, streams uh, during storms. And so there's, there's a level of, um, processing information there, often at a kind of national strategic level, really, uh, in terms of uh, what the likely trends are with climate change, which crops might be affected, uh, and how to therefore build up some degree of preparedness and resilience for climate change, maybe thinking about growing crops which are more resistant to long time periods without much water. Sometimes, often we get too much water with cyclones, other times we get too little. Uh, that's a particularly big issue in Vanuatu, in the islands in Vanuatu and the Solomon Islands and other islands around Fiji as well. Uh, so there are strategic issues there as well. Uh, but then you can come down to more operational issues and the data sets that we're providing are useful then in the event of, well, firstly preparing for uh, a major climate change uh, impact, let's say a cyclone event, we can produce maps which go down to the level of detail in the order of 30 feet by 30 feet, 10 meters by 10 meters. We can get down to that level of detail. Uh, before we used to look at um, areas of a square kilometer. Um, we've moved on a lot since then. We're down to 10 square meters at a time. So each dot on the image corresponds to 10 meters on the ground. So 
more or less the size of a, a, a large house, maybe. Um, that we found that for many countries, especially if they're large archipelago countries, you tend to get a variation in map coverage, and it tends to focus often on the capital island, the main island. It's got a lot of the best maps. You move further away to the more remote areas, and you get less and less data. This is an aspect of data poverty. Um, one thing with the satellite data is the data is common to everybody. Each island is covered by the mapping, not just the capital island. So we can go down to the same levels of detail in terms of, say, height above sea level. Uh, we can go down to the same levels of detail in terms of land cover types and rates of deforestation and things like that. So it means that we're able to provide uh, information not just to the more urban populations that have got access to the uh, internet, but via, uh, say, district government, we can move out to the district offices and the district islands who can then pass the information on to the surrounding islands. So um, we're moving that information out to people who could find that information useful. So we could end up, let's say, not necessarily with a digital map on a phone on a laptop, because some islands don't have that connectivity, but we could issue a paper map produced from the district office, which does have internet access. And then we can have um, village elders and, and uh, community leaders looking at that paper map, looking at the printouts, highlighting particularly hazardous areas and comparing that with their own knowledge, with the lay knowledge. And that makes for a really powerful map then when you're mixing what we've got from the scientific analysis with that local knowledge. That's fantastic. Yeah, I, I love the framing of, of data poverty and data poverty alleviation, I suppose, as it were. Um, but also this, this idea or the possibility of combining different forms of knowledge um, into, you know, one sort of actionable uh, set of information about a specific place. Have you seen specific examples of that where you've got communities uh, bringing together those different forms of knowledge? Um, and then putting those into to use and planning? That's, that's not something we're, we're quite at the stage of yet, although I know it's been happening in some of the areas um, that we're working on. Uh, I've not been directly involved with that, but I have seen examples of that. The key point is you really need a base map on which to then add that local information. And if there aren't any base maps, you can't even really start doing that. So for many islands, especially the remoter islands, you don't, they don't have that level of information in the first place. So as a first step, we really need to produce those base maps, which we can do as a result of the satellite imagery and the open data cube and the analysis ready data. Um, there are other aspects to this as well, let's say where the communities on those islands feel that there's uh, an injustice being done to them. If they go to court, they need a map. Well, a map helps as evidence anyway. This has certainly been the case with displaced peoples Amerindians in South America, uh, where we've had uh, researchers in the past following them on their traditional hunting routes with a GPS receiver. And then those maps produced from there were used as evidence in court. Um, they're also being used, say, with indigenous peoples in Colombia, where there's a lot of illegal gold mining and deforestation. And on other projects that we're doing, uh, we're able to use this satellite imagery, particularly the radar imagery, which can see through the cloud cover that often uh, hides what's down below in the rainforest. Well, those maps that are produced there, again, can be used in court cases uh, where the people have brought uh, a case against the mining companies that are mining illegally. Fantastic. And just to, we have a couple of of questions. I think a lot of people are, are very interested in, in what you're doing here um, and sort of eager to, to know if they can um, take advantage of, of something similar. Can you just say again, sort of the, the geographical scope of what you're providing? Is it um, focused in the small island developing states in the Pacific, or do you have any plans of expanding to, to other regions as well? Uh, the common sensing project at the moment is focused on the small island developing states uh, in the South Pacific, which is primarily then Fiji, Vanuatu, and the Solomon Islands. Um, there have been discussions uh, through the Commonwealth linking across to the Caribbean and comparing the situation in the Caribbean islands with 
uh, many of the uh, Caribbean, Caribbean countries and many of the South Pacific countries as well. Uh, and again, that it's a similar situation that there's often a, a, a shortfall in MAC coverage and the freely available satellite imagery and the open data cube uh, are very much helping with that. There is another aspect to this. If you want to go on and do more processing of the data, then it's one thing to have a map. If you can put it into a geographical information system, that's great because you can do more analysis. You can add more of your own information. But sometimes there's a cost to the GIS, to the software. Uh, fortunately, we've got free and open source software now. So systems like QGIS can readily be used now to import the sorts of data that we've got uh, and you can therefore process that. You then need to provide training, technical training on that as well. And that's an aspect of the common sensing project that UNITAR are very much uh, leading on, providing technical training then to government officials and NGO officials in each of Fiji, Vanuatu and the Solomon Islands. Fantastic, thank you for that. And um, given the interest I'm seeing in our Q&A box, can you remind us one more time um, you know, given that this is a, a fairly open platform where people can go and, and find out more about it um, or even uh, view some of the, the information that you're making available. Yeah, uh, comments, um, well, at um, uh, EO Common Sensing is the Twitter account. And uh, if we go through to www.commonsensing.org.uk, that's the website. But if you just search on the internet and search common sensing, then you're going to find quite a few links through to it. Fantastic. All right, Richard, thank you so much. Um, this has been fascinating to hear about your work. And, and I think um, I'm sure everyone online is, uh, is pretty interested to, to know that this type of information is available and hopefully can be incorporated into the kinds of planning that we're talking about here um, and also brought together with with other forms of information. Um, so thanks so much for for joining us and um, I really appreciate it. Thanks very much for the chat. It was a pleasure. And I'd like to ask if we could bring up the results of the poll um, that we mentioned a little while ago. Um, okay, so um, Looks like we have fairly decisive um, uh, feeling that building community resilience through climate change is the uh, best way to ensure efforts to ensure to counter climate change are equitable. Um, and why don't we bring up the, the second poll if we could, and we'll just ask that question now. And then I will ask if our panelists, panelists want to make any closing remarks um, or reflect on anything that they've, they've heard here today. So here's the, the second poll question, what's needed to ensure climate justice, more support for community-led approaches, including the protection of biocultural diversity in projects and safeguarding the rights of the most vulnerable. Um, so feel free to weigh in there and we'll share those results at the end. Um, all right, well, I'd love to turn it over one more time to our panelists. Um, one thing that we didn't quite get to, um, or at least didn't emphasize, uh, and I know that it's been an interest of, of several peoples here, um, the issue of preserving biocultural diversity, which was raised in that last poll. Um, does anyone want to weigh in on, on whether you feel that when we're talking about climate resilience, um, we're talking about sort of cultural resilience, uh, which does seem to me to be also sort of at the heart of this conversation about climate justice. You know, what is being preserved? One of our um, audience members pointed out that for a lot of people, ground is not just ground. Sometimes it's sacred ground and, and loss of a section of ground means something different to different people, depending on their experiences with it. How does this question of biocultural diversity and biocultural loss fit into this conversation? I'll throw that out there and then I'll welcome any closing remarks um, for those who, uh, who want to add them. And thanks again. I'd quickly say, Michael, that um, in indigenous systems, uh, biological diversity, uh, you know, the species, animals, plants, insects, everything is seen in a, in a 
family relationship. The, the relationships are relationships in a genealogical sense. There are mythical ties uh, and, and plants, birds, and animals are interpreted as part of, you know, more than just a landscape and an ecosystem and so on. They're interpreted as family, uh, as are many environmental hazards, right? So when we talk of an indigenous approach, it reframes this so-called uh, this natural environment. It's part of the, the human environment. So it's a very close and intimate relationship, which makes the loss of biological diversity more traumatic, more personal, uh, and, and for many people, for those who still live in, in a traditional way, uh, you know, it's a very, very difficult thing to deal with and hard for people to imagine working their way through. So it's really, it's fundamental to a lot of indigenous uh, identities. So very, very important. Yeah, if I may uh, just add briefly to that. Um, yeah, simply loss of biological diversity equals loss of culture because the practices that we have with fishing methods, with weaving relies heavily on that ecological system being healthy. Um, and and that this, this is the loss that I was talking about before, that we, we have to start documenting this. It's often overlooked because it's a non-economic loss. It can't be quantified uh, easily, but it is irreplaceable. Um, and so yeah, we have to be more um, innovative in, in the ways that we actually record that message and document it and keep it for, for as the inherent rights of, of our children. Um, I think the, you know, one of the big challenges that we have is also uh, just listening to, to, to the community and trying to marry the science that we have with this, uh, with the biology and, and, uh, and reflections of, of elderly people, right? So we, we've got some of the latest science on modeling tuna stocks in the Pacific, for example. This is the last healthy tuna stock in the world. Um, we have probably have the most advanced climate uh, impact modeling on, on these species um, and it's supposed to be healthy and fished at the right sustainable levels but if i look back 40 years to the catches that we had in our country that our fishermen caught they don't catch anywhere near the size of those fish that they're not in the frequency either so there's something a little bit awry with what some some of the science is telling us with what our historical knowledge is and I think that's very important to bring together. The other thing is, uh, you know, SPC has uh, the biggest, longest standing um, uh, genetic bank in the Pacific uh, that brings together the genetic diversity um, tissue of all of the species that we have in, agri in agriculture and a separate one in fisheries as well developing. What we don't have tied to that, unfortunately, is the traditional knowledge and of how to use those different varieties. And so they, they need resourcing to be able to add that dimension of, of cultural heritage with that diversity because we've lost those species because to export taro, for example, to New Zealand and Australia, we had to refine down you know, the species of taro. So we've lost a range of those. Those are in that bank. So that if we ever need them, which ironically we have had to, in COVID, we've had a huge demand across the Pacific to draw down on that tissue culture, to diversify back again, the traditional root crops and, and food security that our communities depend on. But we don't have the traditional knowledge of how to grow those varieties anymore. And COVID ironically has provided an opportunity for us to look back at that heritage and get the older people who now maybe aren't involved in jobs as much to work with the younger people to plant those. So now's the time for us to document that so we don't lose it for the next generation because my generation and my parents' generation, they still know they have that knowledge, but our kids are distracted by, you know, iPads and, and phones and things nowadays. So getting that time to go back is a very precious opportunity, but we need to document that. Um, and we need the resources for that. Thanks. Hi, this is Jackie. I would just, uh, well, I guess two points. One is, Eve, as it relates to the first survey, and, and these points are interconnected, that uh, when we look at the first survey, the choices were even in some ways 
uh, a false separation when we when we recognize that uh, the interconnectedness. When we talk about uh, racial justice, for example, or racial inequities, that climate justice encompasses racial inequity. So it's not an either or, what should we do this or should we do that, or what should be prioritized because it's intersectional. And similarly, this question about biodiversity is one where our problem has been that we have lost track of, of this notion of inalienable rights and we've lost track of what ecosystems actually mean and our interdependence within inter within the ecosystem. So we have indigenous traditions that are closer to the land um, and we, we, we define that as culture, but it's really an understanding that we are interdependent with the land and with, and with our ecosystems. And the problem that we've gotten into is how society has, has, does not recognize that and the practices, the harmful practices that we have brought on, our, on the earth and on, on ourselves has been a result of that, of that separation and, and lack of relationship as part of the, the uh, harmonious ecosystem. So, so as um, Coral said, if we could just get back to that understanding. Right now I'm growing a flourishing balcony garden. And so during this stay at home situation, I could technically sustain myself on what I'm growing on my garden. If we could all just remember that the earth creates what we need and bountifully, then, um, then we would be in a much better place. So thank you. Mm -hmm. That's a hopeful vision. Kamal, last word to you and uh, hopefully, a, yes, an uplifting one to, to send us out on. Well, thank you, Michael. I guess Coral and Jackie has pretty much summed up like whatever conversation I was having in my mind um, when I heard that question, because especially for here in the Pacific, you know how um, culture sort of plays a very crucially integral in an integral role, um, especially when we talk about climate change, like for example, when you have communities relocating, the land has so much meaning to us and the ocean has so much meaning to its people because it's sort of like a, uh, it gives you your livelihood. You go fishing, um, there are many who sell it. So it's just sort of a way of, li way of life for them, right? So imagine if a community is being relocated and you have to leave behind that land where you have buried your ancestors, that's where your traditional ties are linked to. and just moving to an entirely new place and you're just not even sure how you will be able to sustain yourself. Will you be able to, uh, you know, sort of get that support that will be needed to help you restart your livelihood, basically. Like, will you be better off or will you be in a far much more worse position than, than you were in at your old site, probably because of rising sea levels. So now you're being relocated to a newer land. So instead of having to rely on the sea for, um, sustainable uh, subsist substance substantive living sorry um you know now you have to switch to agricultural farming methods to uh, sort of be able to earn a living but you're not sure how that will turn out so yeah i guess um these are some of the things that you always have to sort of keep in mind when you talk about it especially um talking about rural indigenous people because for us here in the Pacific, even in Fiji, as Coral had mentioned, uh, majority of the coastal villages uh, villages are located within one to five kilometer range of the coastal uh, of the coastal areas. So, yeah. Great, thank you, Kamal. I think that's a really wonderful reminder that we might be talking about physical geographies. We might be talking about spatial issues, but ultimately, we're also talking about um, people and human stories and people's deep cultural connections to the world um, as it changes in profound ways. Um, all right, well, this was fantastic. Let's bring up the, the final results from the second poll, um, just as I send us out here. Um, but I really, I just want to thank all of our speakers um, who I think brought a number of different and extremely complimentary um, but challenging perspectives to bear on this question. Um, I really can't thank you enough for joining us. Let's see here. What's needed to ensure climate justice? More support for community-led approaches, including the protection of biocultural diversity, safeguarding the rights of the most vulnerable. I think we're gonna go with um, Jackie's answer, which is that we need all of those things and they're completely inseparable from one another. Um, and perhaps the, the division in responses reflects that a little bit. Um, I, uh, I wanted to remind you that we'll be sharing a recording of the webinar and illustration with everybody who's, uh, who's joined us today. 
I also want to send a sincere thank you to the Common Sensing Consortium partners, of which Dev DevX is a member, um, and to the UK Space Agency for its funding of the International Partnerships Program that Common Sensing feeds into. And I hope you all um, learned a lot from Richard's overview and, and um, description of that project, which is a pretty amazing source of uh, information and insight. Um, thanks again to everyone who joined us today. I'm sure we would all be loudly applauding our panelists if we were all in person. Um, and here's to that happening someday. Thanks very much. And uh, thank you again.